Well, son, when one culture loves another very, very much. Personally, I feel like Japanese curry doesn't get enough love compared to its counterparts from India or Thailand, for instance. Maybe it's my ignorance, but I just don't feel like it's on the same spectrum as those dishes. Which is wild to me because it's such a huge dish in Japan, it's actually their national dish. I feel like in the States at least we put Japan in this box of sushi and hibachi. But I'm here to tell you if you didn't know that their curry and rice is insane. I'm no expert on the dish, but I'm going to show you how I made it along with a few personal additions that I think might be useful to you. For starters, I paired this with a chicken katsu cutlet. Traditionally, this is done with pork, but for me, chicken is more widely available in my freezer. But I'll get to that in a minute. For the curry, it's important to note that it's more traditional to use the curry mix than it is to make it from scratch. I'm going to be using this hot golden curry mix, which is very popular, and the box says the cubes are enough to make 12 portions. So what I decided to do was to use up all the curry mix in one go because I didn't want to have any left over, and I would just make a huge batch of curry and then I'll show you what I tried to do at the end. So in the description, I'm going to list out what I used for this huge portion, which is 12 servings servings, but you can divide it accordingly to what you want to make. What I like about this dish is it doesn't seem like there's really one standard way to do it. Different people just use whatever they have to make their own version of it, so it's very customizable to what you have available. For my vegetables, I'm using some yellow onion, carrot, yellow bell pepper, some small yellow potatoes, and by the way, I'm loving all the gold and yellow vibes here. I'm also using some fresh garlic, fresh ginger, and finally a red apple. I started by chopping the carrot into some nice sized chunks and then followed suit with the bell pepper. I try to roughly match their sizes so that everything's equally distributed in the curry. Then I repeated that with the potatoes, since these were so small I didn't bother peeling them, but if they were bigger I probably would have. So I combined all of those so far into one bowl because they were all going to be going in at the same time. And then I minced up my ginger as well as my garlic and combined those into their own container because they were going to go in at the same time as well. Then I peeled the skin off the apple and then chopped off the sides from the core. And then I used a box grater to shred it up. A lot of recipes include this to add a depth of sweetness to the curry, which I think is quite nice. I'm saving the onions for last because I'm going to be cooking them first, that way I can keep them on the cutting board. I'm just slicing these fairly thick slices from root to stem. I don't want to cut them so thin that they'll melt into the curry. I want to leave them thick enough so that they're still noticeable even after cooking down. So to get things started, I got my cast iron Dutch oven well heated over medium high. And to keep things in the tune of curry, I'm using a few tablespoons of ghee, which I got at my Indian market. It's just a lot more flavorful than neutral oil, but it's not going to burn like butter. So I went in with the onions first, and I just stirred them constantly for like 5-7 to seven minutes. I'm just looking for them to soften and get a little bit of browning on them. At this point, I'm going to add in my veggie trio of carrot, bell pepper, and potato. And again, I'm just going to constantly stir this. You can raise this all the way to high heat. With the amount of water in the vegetables, it's not going to burn as long as you keep stirring. After about 5 more minutes of that, in goes the garlic and ginger. I'm only going to give those about a minute of stirring before I add in the shredded apple. This stuff is just going to melt into the sauce later, it's going to be so good. Just a couple more minutes of stirring and then I'm going to quickly add in 3 beef bouillon cubes. A lot of these curries start with a beef or chicken base, but I'm not doing that here because of the katsu cutlet. So I'm going to supplement a little bit by adding back some of that beef flavor. And then after about 15 total minutes of stirring, I'm going to deglaze with my water. Remember, I always list the full ingredient amounts in my description. So once the water's in, I'm just going to stir occasionally and let it come to a boil. And I impulse added a couple of dried shiitake mushrooms at this point because I had them in my pantry. And I knew they'd add a lot of deep flavor to my stock. I'm just going to cover and simmer that on low for about 15 more minutes. At which point you can skim off any scum that rises to the top, especially if you started with a meat base. But this should at least smell like the most heavenly veggie broth that you've ever smelled in your life. Okay, and here comes the star of the show, which is the golden curry mix. Again, I'm using the full package here because it's going to be easier to store the curry after it's already made than it is to worry about the curry mix going bad and having to make another batch soon. This stuff is going to contain all the deep flavors, including the curry powder, which is going to give us our distinct curry flavor. And it should just melt right in with the heat when you stir it all together. This should thicken up and darken your broth, as well as fill your house with the most beautiful curry aroma that you can imagine. Man, this stuff is so good. Finally, I think the most fun part is adding in your own flavorings. This is where you can get a little creative, and I think everyone does it their own way, which is awesome. I would add some salty component like salt or like I'm doing soy sauce. I'm also adding in some white pepper, you could also do black pepper. And then I would include something to give more umami flavor. I'm using Worcestershire sauce, but you could also use something like fish sauce. And then of course some more sweetness, we already got some from the apple, but this curry can definitely stand to use more. You could use something like white sugar or brown sugar or even palm sugar, or you can use corn syrup, but I'm just going to use honey here. If you feel like this needs something more acidic, you can add some kind of vinegar in. I didn't feel the need to add any here. But yeah, what's important is that you taste as you go and then try to add what you think it needs. This kind of fine tuning to get to that final flavor profile that you want is so vital. It separates the good home cooked dishes from the great ones, and it does take time and experience to figure out the things that you like, but it's worth it. Think of it just like dating. You gotta get out there and try it before you find out what you like. 
I'm just finishing with a couple of tablespoons of cold butter. It's gonna add a beautifully rich flavor, but also some shine to our curry. And that's really it. I'm just gonna simmer this on low while I prep everything else, which I did cook some rice to serve this over. I'm using short grain sushi rice because I think it tastes and feels the best, but you can use whatever rice that you have. It's just important that you give it a nice rinse beforehand. I just use a sieve over bowl and agitate it a bit to get rid of the starch. And then I repeat the process two to three times until I get the water to run clear. I usually use about 60 grams or a third of a cup of dry rice per portion. I'm making two portions here, and I just throw this into my rice cooker and let it do its thing. Now for the final component, the crispy chicken katsu. I think this is best done with the chicken breast because they're more presentable shape. What I do is I just split my chicken breast in half from top to bottom, cutting it lengthwise like this, trying to stay as even as possible, but I admit that is a little hard to do. But that's okay, we can fix any deficiencies with our meat mallet. I just put the pieces under some plastic wrap and just pound away until I get some nice, thin, even pieces of meat. This is really important because of how fast this is going to cook, we don't want to overcook any parts of it. And we definitely don't want to undercook any parts of it. And I like to do this step if I have time, I cover both sides of the cutlet in salt. Not too much because of how thin it is, you don't want to oversalt this. But I put this in the fridge to dry brine for at least a few hours or ideally overnight. And what that's going to do is it's going to internally season the meat, which admittedly isn't a huge concern with a piece of chicken this thin. That's more ideal for something like a thick steak, but it can still help here. But more importantly what it's going to do is it's going to dry out the outside of that chicken breast, which is going to help with making it super crispy. But it's not the end of the world if you don't have time, you can just salt this and go right to the next step. Which is prepping the three stage breading station. I'm not measuring anything here because I'm only doing this one chicken breast at this time, but this is really fine to eyeball here anyway, it's only going to absorb what it can. In dish one I'm just dumping a little bit of all purpose flour. Dish two I'm just going to beat an egg with a splash of water. I would note that you should use one egg for about every two cutlets that you're making at that time, but beat it well so that there's no globby parts left that's going to mess with the coating of the chicken. And the final dish is the most important stage and that's the panko breadcrumbs. These are specially manufactured breadcrumbs that are going to go super crispy when you fry them. I'll also note that I'm filling a shallow pot with some peanut oil. You don't need to go super deep on the oil because the chicken cutlets are so thin. I always use a candy thermometer for accuracy and I'm shooting for about 370 degrees here. But anyway, to bread our chicken, I'm just going to coat it evenly in the flour. Make sure to press the flour into every crevice of the chicken so that there's no raw part showing. Once you shake off the excess, you can go into the egg wash. And the same thing applies here. You're trying to coat every bit of it so that now there's no dry part showing. And if you beat the egg thoroughly enough, you shouldn't have a problem with everything sticking here. Drip off the excess once again and then go into the panko. Now it's really important that you coat every single part of the chicken here with the panko. Really press it in. Flip it over a couple times and make sure every piece is as coated as possible. The more panko you get to stick to it, the crispier your final product is going to be. Now once your oil is at temp, you can lay this into the oil carefully and away from you. These should fry and cook through in a flash in the hot oil and being as thin as they are. I only let mine go for about 45 seconds per side, flipping it halfway through, and once I saw a nice browning around the edge, I knew that was good. You can use a meat thermometer here for super accuracy, but I don't think it's necessary. So I immediately move that to a wire rack to let it cool and let the air circulate around it so it remains crispy. And I also love to hit it with some flaky sea salt, just adds a nice crunchy salty bite to different parts of the chicken. Just give that a couple minutes to rest and then you can cut it into those iconic strips. So let me just stop talking for a minute and let you enjoy this. I mean, come on. Okay, now we're pretty much done. All we need to do is assemble our bowl. Just to make it nice and pretty for presentation, I'm gonna layer one side with that freshly steamed rice, and then for the other half, I'm gonna add a few ladlefuls of that beautiful curry. You could obviously just pour the curry right over the rice if you don't care about making a thumbnail like I do. And then I'm gonna carefully add in my chicken cutlet right in between the two. And then to garnish, I'm just gonna add in a little bit of fukujinzuke, which is just a traditional mixture of Japanese pickled vegetables, like daikon radish, eggplant, lotus root, and cucumber. I got this pre-mixed at my local Asian grocer. Most Asian grocery stores should carry packs like this, but you can add any pickled vegetable that you like or nothing at all. And I'm also adding in some freshly sliced green onion for color. And yeah, that's it, my version of Japanese curry. I like how free-flowing this recipe is and how adjustable it is to each home cook. It really doesn't take all that long because most of the work is done already in that curry mix, but it sure tastes like it takes all day to make. So I'm really proud of how this turned out, in the looks department at least. Let's find out how it tastes. I can't believe it took me this long to do this. And yes, I did go out and buy this wide serving bowl just for this purpose today, but I'm definitely going to get some use out of it going forward. It's been smelling good and I've been tasting it to just seasoning, so I already know it's great. But let's start with one of the strips of the chicken katsu. Cheers! Mm. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, you really can't replace the panko with regular breadcrumbs. It gives it such a distinct texture and flavor. Just make that by itself. That's that's the winner here. No, but for real, let's get in with some of the rice and this curry. The vegetables are perfectly tender. The flavor is great from us adjusting the seasonings throughout. That's a really good curry. Which, speaking of, do you have a favorite style of curry? Do you appreciate more the Indian curry or the Thai style of curry or this Japanese curry, for instance? Let me know. Every time I try a new recipe, I'm blown back by how picky I was growing up and how much I was missing out on. There's so much food to enjoy out in the world, and it's really cool to see how this dish, for example, has evolved, coming from different cultures and then being applied into the new culture that it's in. For that reason, I think it's important for us to not always have to stick to tradition, because a really good dish coming from one country can be even better or just as good made a different way in a different country, just based off the resources that exist there. Mm, definitely necessary bite of pickles along with the richness of the curry. Yeah, I'm just in heaven. As you can see, I made a ton of portions of this and I'm not gonna eat all of them right now or even in the coming week. I'm gonna eat like one more portion tomorrow. So let me show you how I'm gonna try to conserve the rest of this. So like I said before, I made a bunch of portions of this curry because I wanted to use up all the curry mix and that way I'd only have to make it one time to enjoy the 12 portions that I made. But the problem is I don't wanna eat all 12 portions right now or even in the next few days. I only plan to eat two portions of this and then I wanted to save the rest. But instead of freezing this into one big container, which would be really hard for me to defrost only one portion at a time, I'm gonna rip a page from Adam Argusia's book with what he does with his bolognese sauce, which I've already made his bolognese sauce multiple times before and I've used this method to success. He freezes his sauce into ice cube trays and then once it's frozen he dumps it into a ziploc bag and then he's got all these tiny portions where he can pull out just what he needs to defrost and have instant meals at the ready. So I definitely wanted to try that with this curry but the problem is this is super chunky and those chunks aren't really going to fit right into the ice cube trays. So what I did is I removed that second portion that I was going to eat maybe tomorrow and then with the rest of the curry I took an immersion blender and then went to town inside of the pot. I wasn't really aiming to make this a full puree, but I wanted to break down those bigger chunks just so that they'd fit better into the ice cube trays. So I know it might look a little less appetizing, but that's the price I'm willing to pay to have like 10 more meals ready at any time. So I did the same thing, I put these into my ice cube trays and froze them overnight, and then I just cracked all of them into this plastic bag, and now whenever I'm hungry I just grab 3 or 4 curry cubes, and then I just heat them in a microwave bowl for a few minutes until they're the temp that I like. I don't make the cutlet every time because I don't always feel like it, but that's okay. I think the curry is good just standing on its own. Though in hindsight, this makes me wish I had gone back and started with a beef or chicken base for this curry. But I have to say, even after freezing, this curry is still really, really good. I would have never known it was frozen unless you told me. And I personally think this is great because I thrive off of having quick lunches available. I eat the bolognese sauce all the time or I eat something like instant ramen. So adding this curry into the mix is really good for me. This is a staple that I'm going to use from now on. It's really healthy because it's got lots of vegetables, but it's also deeply flavored, so it's going to satisfy me. So I'm not the expert on Japanese curry, but I hope I gave you some insight on this video that even if you don't make the recipe I did, you can still take something from this. Whether it be this method of freezing your soups and sauces into ice cube trays, which is not my idea, or the idea of being creative with your flavorings to make things fit your taste better. Either way, if you watched this video, I really appreciate you. I really enjoy doing stuff like this, so having you here with me means the world. There's lots more to come, but let me know what else you'd like to see from me. As always, thank you all for watching, be blessed, and I'll see you all next time.